Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our latest lunch and learn event. I guess not. Oh, we are on live. Okay. Back in my old radio DJ days, Ty, forgot to turn the record off before I started speaking. And back when I actually did spin records at my first radio job, actual vinyl records. Anyway, uh, good to have you with us. As always, we uh, really enjoy the opportunity to get together in these events and help keep our firm and family engaged uh, as to what's going on and have some fun in the process. We've got a good one lined up for you today. Of course, I say that every week because I believe that we always do. But getting a chance to spend some time with Doug Allison today, the men's soccer coach, as well as McNeil Cronin and uh, I hope Quinn will make an appearance uh, as uh, his dual special guests on our get together today. A couple of things to remind you of. Uh, next week, we will be uh, taking the week off. Of course, next Tuesday is election day. So uh, kind of in keeping with what's going on uh, across the athletic spectrum in the NCAA, we're going to shut this down, make sure everybody has every ample opportunity to uh, do their civic duty and vote. And we'll return in two weeks on November 10th, we'll spend the hour with the uh, tennis coaches here at Furman, J.J. Whitlinger and uh, Adam Herendine. And then uh, we will do, on November 17th, we'll do the golf programs with Matt Davidson and Jeff Hull. And that one will be our last Lunch and Learn until after the first of the year. We're going to take uh, a break for the holidays. Also remind you that uh, tomorrow coming up at noon is a celebration of the 1988 national championship football team here at Furman. That one is not just a click and attend regular zoom session. That is a webinar that you must pre-register for, but there are plenty of slots. So you can uh, go to Furman's social media. You can check FurmanPaladins.com and check that out. We're going to have several members of that 88 championship team here uh, tomorrow. And we're going to be watching some video clips of the game and getting their thoughts on it. Led by uh, Captain Jeff Blankenship, Frankie DeBusk is going to be here, George Quarles, uh, Steve uh, Dugan is going to be here. I believe uh, uh, Julius Dixon is going to make an appearance, Kenneth Goldsmith, Keith Swilling, maybe David Adams. There could be a number of them on board. So that's going to be fun. But again, you have to register for that. It's in webinar form. You can get Furman's social media to uh, check that out. All right, let's welcome in uh, a guy who, uh, when you talk about successful coaches on this campus, uh, he is at the top. Doug Allison, the men's soccer coach uh, here at Furman, is joining us. Douglas, how you doing, sir? Doing very well, Dan. Thanks for having me. You and Ty, I appreciate it. It's good to see you. Good to get a chance to uh, talk with you again. Normally at this time of year, you and I be doing weekly visits to uh, kind of catch folks up on what's going on uh, in your world athletically. Um, not able to do that this year, so it's good to good to see you in this format and, and get a chance to poke a little fun at you along the way. I know you miss that. I know you miss me jabbing you a little bit every once in a while. Yeah, I, I used to love those shows, Dan, every every week, just to tell the, everyone about the, the season and how it's going and finding out if you actually know anything about soccer at all every week. So it's, it's actually great to, to see you here, Dan. And, you look great, found, too, by the way. You look we found great. out very uh, – thank you. I appreciate that. We found out very quickly the answer to that question was no, correct? <laughs> that, I, that I didn't know anything about soccer. Yeah, but, but that's, you've all right. been a, you've, that's all right. You've been a good teacher. Yeah, you, yeah, between between you and Andrew, you you have been very very uh, uh, patient. Let's put it that way, uh, as far as that's concerned. Hey, uh, right here at the, at the very beginning, I, I don't want to belabor the point too long because we want to have some fun with this, and and especially uh, in, in the second half with what we're going to do with with McNeil and, and Quinn and and uh, the recognition for Down syndrome. But um, understand that you lost your father last week. And on behalf of the entire athletic department, Doug, we just wanted to extend our condolences to you and, and uh, just know that we're thinking about you and our prayers are with you and your family at this time. And I know it's got to be especially difficult being on opposite sides of the ocean. Yeah, yeah. But I don't want to say too much, but I appreciate the, uh, the messages people have sent. It's, it's not fun. It's, not, it's been a tough year. For a lot of people, not just me, but um, a lot of people have going through some times right now. And we talked to our team about that last week, Dan, about, you know, 
telling the people you love that you love them. So thanks for starting off this way, Dan. I appreciate it. So. Well, uh, I, there were there was no easy way or no easy time to do it, uh, yeah. a, but but a message that that we as the athletic department wanted to convey because we love you, and we know that uh, we know that this is very difficult. So now let's move on, and, and let let's have some fun um, as we always do. Uh, we want you to send us your questions in the chat uh, aspect of, of Zoom here. You can send them directly to me, or you can send them to Ty, and he will send them to me, and uh, we'll pass those along to Doug. And then uh, a little bit later on, we're going to have uh, McNeil Cronin joining us here. And, and uh, we're going to talk about the annual Quinn game, which uh, unfortunately this year is going to have to wait until the spring, but the, the marvelous work that he and, and Doug and this soccer program have done individually and collectively to bring awareness to Down syndrome. And, and let's just, let's just start right there, Doug. Um, that that is such a, a wonderful thing and I know we're going to talk about it more later but uh, Angela and I my wife and I uh, actually got a chance to come to the Quinn game last year we had such a blast with that um, and, and I know that it's got to be difficult among other things not doing that here in, in this uh, in this fall there there's a, a photo I love that picture of Manil and, and Quinn isn't that isn't that precious that's just amazing I love that picture that she is such a wonderful little girl and you know, I mean, Neil's an incredible alumni. I know we're going to talk more. And I think Susan May's on the call as well with, um, with the Down Syndrome Alliance out in Kansas City. So, hey, Susan, hope, hope you're doing great. Um, and, and hopefully the Greenville uh, Alliance is here in the upstate. But what McNeil's done is incredible. I'm, I'm just so glad that a lot of people will get to know his story. That That's the main thing I want to talk about today. And, you know, the, obviously the program is important, but the, what our alumni have done is really important. I, I know a lot of alumni are on today, which is nice for me, but uh, supporting McNeil is, is a big, big thing for me. Well, and, and we're going to spend a, a good chunk of time, as you said, uh, with McNeil and, and with some of these other folks that you have uh, asked to join the, uh, the call today uh, and, and bringing to the forefront as much as we can anyway, awareness for down center but let, let's talk a little bit about your program now I, I ask every coach when we start this I'll ask you normally you're playing at this time of year and, yeah. and going through the grind obviously that's not happening how are you handling it how are your players handling it are you finding any positives at all out of it um we're, we're trying to definitely find positives I've talked to a lot of alumni like like Scotty Blunt and and Higgy and, and um, Derek and, and uh, Lisi and a few guys like that are still involved in coaching as well and talking to them about it. And, uh, and I appreciate their comments as well because we're all trying to find positives. And uh, luckily, we've got a great group of kids. Um, you know, I think it started this summer, Dan, uh, when everyone was feeling sorry for themselves and didn't really know what was going on with COVID. And um, it was just, what do we do? Everyone was searching for ideas of what to do. And uh, Adam Herendeen, actually our, our women's tennis coach, came up with a great idea to get all our coaches together and talk about um, how, to, how to keep our coaches and how to keep our players involved. And I really appreciate what well, Adam took the lead on that. Um, but I really wanted to keep our kids relevant. And we talked about staying ready instead of getting ready. And no matter where uh, we were with it and, uh, you know, in, in the world where they were, we're going to get back together and hopefully we'd have a season. At that point, we still had a season, so we're still training for preseason. But then when we lost it, we lost the chance that Duke was coming here, Wake Forest was coming here, South Carolina was coming here. We had a great season lined up for the fans and the players, and, and obviously losing that was very, very tough. So uh, with with the guys being so competitive, it, it's, um, you know, we, we started doing things. I talked to Derek Marinettos and, and Lisi a little bit about doing a Friday night lights uh, thing every other week and through ties ad advertising and trying to get people in and trying to get kids to the game like the Den group and just trying to get students on campus to hear, uh, how can we make this relevant? How can we make it important? And, you know, um, a good friend of mine and my mentor in coaching, TJ Williams, who I think is on down, down in Florida right now, he told me that, you know, the fish rots from the head first and you're in charge. So you need to get your kids be positive and get your kids going. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we started ideas like the Friday Night Lights with Ty and 
So every other week, can we do something to, to make it competitive? Our squad plays each other. Hopefully we can get families to join in and come watch. We can get students to come watch. And uh, it started off then we weren't allowed to have the students here just, just for safety reasons. But this past week with the uh, Purple White Week that, that you guys have had was fantastic in every sport. And I think the students really wanted to see that they had uh, a live sporting event to go to. And uh, we had people outside the stadium on blankets and trying to get in and crawling over the fences and repelling from ceilings and stuff. We had people uh, sliding in the press box, trying to pretend they were pizza delivery people. We had people everywhere getting in and, and seeing the parents finally get to watch their sons play and you know, Ty streaming the event as well uh, to the parents that couldn't see their sons play was, uh, was very important. So I think we've kept it relevant. We've kept it competitive. It's a great time to develop your kids for the spring, the spring season. So we've taken the attitude down of we're developing our kids and we're trying different, different systems. We've tried four through threes and three, five twos, stuff that you don't understand, which is great, but we're trying <laughs> these systems more and more. And some of it's working, some of it's not working. And we're really seeing a great way. It's a good way for freshmen to be in to, to be developed. It's, a, it's the best time they've ever had to be developed. So we've got our whole squad here. So we're, we're trying to stay as positive as we can. Hey, hey, hey Doug, I, I, I take a, a very simple approach. See the ball, kick the ball. So uh, that, that's, that's about my approach to the game. Uh, but it's nice to have that kind of interest. It's not, uh, say, uh, a ride in a place like Liverpool interest or something like that, but to have students who, who are so uh, engaged and, and wanting to be part of something on this campus. I, I think maybe we're finding out that sports around Furman uh, is a little more popular than even some people thought. But, but and, and as it is with a lot of things, you don't know what you've got really until it's gone, do you? No, and, and it's true. And then there's, there's kids on this campus like Jonah Dill, who's on the track team, and, and Owen Cannon. I believe they're on the call as well. And, and Ty, I, I think you need to introduce them at some point. The, these guys are called the Den. They've, they've formed an official club here at Farman and they were a group of freshmen that, that uh, they and my Callum, uh, my son Callum started with boys and girls at Farman as freshmen and our team went and met with them at lunch uh, last year and said Let, let's get a group of guys that want to paint up, bring drums, do different things at the, at the game and, uh, and, and not just support our team but support every team on campus. So Ty, I don't know if these guys are on yet. Yeah, I can, I can see Jonah and Owen right now. Okay. <laughs> hey, guys. How you doing? Tell them a little bit about your story, why you wanted to get, get it going on campus. And we really appreciate your support. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So it started fall of our freshman year. Uh, we went to one of your games, and Owen and I both brought these, like, giant oversized yellow cards <laughs> and we started like chirping at the the other team and we're like heckling the refs and stuff and just just having a good time and more and more people kind of like joined in bringing this high energy and then eventually ty the director of marketing and fan experience he approached us and he said like let's let's make this a, a big official thing like you guys have something let's run with it yeah. and so we were able to kind of like put together even a bigger group and just like paint our chests, get drums like you were saying to uh get to i think clemson game was our first like big turnout and so just more and more people were coming and we were like trying to bring in more people really get a good energy behind the Furman men's soccer team yeah and then um so this year we're excited to announce we're officially a, a sga club so uh, we're looking to get a lot more members um and students on the call, uh, you can join at the uh, Instagram. It's in the links in the bio, and it's uh, at the Furman Den. Um, and we're really looking to get as many members as possible to support y'all and uh, all you do. And uh, we're looking to make a big splash in the, all the games that in the spring. Um, since there'll be a ton, uh, we're looking to get as many of those as possible and get as many students involved as we can. Yeah, I think the the initiative was great last year, guys. I think uh, just having boys and girls from regular students on campus, whether they're on teams or not, wherever they're from, and then growing and growing and growing. And then uh, now you guys are sophomores, you're recruiting all the other freshmen on the team and to be part of the group. But you coming out to support all the teams at Furman is fantastic. And, you know, don't forget where you started, painting up. You, you're not, <laughs> not going to miss our games. That's important. But, yes. you know, having the drums, the big yellow cards, the red cards, the, the scarves up and all that stuff, it really means a lot to our team. 
knowing that you guys are there. And I'd like you guys to sit and take a picture behind the opposing bench, uh, right behind them and screaming at them. Next we time. Love <laughs> I love it. Absolutely love it. Thank you guys for being part of the call. And again, you can go check out their Instagram page if you're a student to uh, officially join what is now uh, an SGA uh, organization here at Furman. So check that out and and uh, go get a little, a little bit of controlled rowdiness, Doug. Is that what we're looking for? Organized chaos is what we call Organized it. Organized chaos. Regular fans, they, got sing, they, they sing songs, not Liverpool songs, but and songs <laughs> that Higgy used to sing when he was here with us as well. But, you know, good songs that they're in. They're, they're, cheering, they're cheering the team on. They're, they're painting out. They're putting big fat heads out there and stuff. But, but I like it, the fact that they go to all the games. Uh, I think that they go to a lot of different teams' events, uh, and they're – they're students at Furman supporting Furman events. And that's what, that's what it is. They're passionate about Furman. I love that. Uh, the Furman Den, D-E-N, The Furman Den is the Instagram handle. So you can go look up more information there. Uh, Ty, let's, uh, first of all, let's throw up that, uh, that first picture that we have of uh, the athlete, Doug Allison. Oh, God. Look at that. <laughs> how... how I'm surprised that's color. How how old is that? Nine, what 19 uh, 1995 somewhere along those lines? I tell you, notice that you never had to wear shin guards in those days as well. <laughs> that that was that was an option that I chose definitely not to wear. Those shirts are pretty heavy. They're not the tight shirts that we wear these days. That the coach Tuck gets us from our Nike shirts. They're the old uh, Umbro shirts. I'm glad you took that down. Thanks for scaring a lot of people off. That was. Uh, I remember that game. That game was against Clemson. I remember that was a away game against Clemson. What year? 85. 85. Yeah. That's when they invented color, as my, uh, my son told me. I was going to say. Every other yeah. picture's in black and white. I, I was going to say you're, you're, you're so old that your first, your, your, your first, uh, first coach was in black and white, wasn't he? Right, that's true. <laughs> Everything else is in black and white. When Keegan was a little younger, he, he said to me, Dad, when did they invent color? I thought, you cheeky little thing. But he was being serious, you know. You're right. So, uh, but, so you've, you've been uh, in, in this country now for obviously a long time uh, in, involved in the uh, soccer scene here. So we wondered... For people who have known you for a long time, Doug, how being an Englishman in America has affected certain aspects of your life. So that is the subject of today's poll brought to you, <laughs> I believe, as uh, Ty will pop it up on the screen here in just a moment. There it is brought to you by Christopher Trucks. All these years in the U.S., how's it affected Doug's accent? Does Doug have an English accent with a hint of Southern to it? Or does he now have a Southern accent with a hint of English to it? We're going to let you guys vote on that, and we will revisit that a little bit later on. We also have a it's more of a question. hybrid accent, I think, Dan. It's just hybrid. <laughs> we also have a trivia question coming up in a bit that you're not eligible oh. to participate in. So, um Let's get to some questions that have been submitted by some folks here. Uh, the first one says that the stadium and field have uh, have already been named. I guess it should be pitch, have already been yeah. named in honor of people. Uh, what do you envision will eventually be named in honor of Furman Hall of Famer Matt Goldsmith? I'm not sure what Goldie could do because it, it could be a celebration that we 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 do all the time because he used to do this Keanu Reeves celebration which was legendary for all the alumni that's on here and he used to look a little bit like Keanu Reeves too so it could be a celebration that we do that or a pregame thing but Matt Goldsmith was a terrific player I hope he's on today I'm not sure but uh you know him getting in the Hall of Fame we've had a lot of guys get into the Hall of Fame now which uh, is fantastic so um, I'm not sure what they'll name after Goldie, but I, I think what I remember most is after he scored a goal, his, his celebration was brilliant. I know some of the alumni will remember that. The, the Goldie goal? Is that yeah, what they call yeah. it? Yeah, the Goldie goal. That'd be a nice one. Yeah. Uh, what advice would you give a high school senior who missed his junior season and has limited exposure in recruiting right now? This is a tough time, Dan, just to be honest, and I think all the coaches will agree that are on here. This is a tough time for high school seniors, particularly as college athletes are getting another year of eligibility and another year to play and possible grad school. So a lot of coaches who have seen some players previously, I think that's okay. Uh, but a lot of uh, high school 
juniors who are now seniors have lost their year, uh, their last year to play. Not It's not just colleges. So it, I hope they get to play so we get to see them, but I'm not sure if they will. Um, so film is one big thing. And, um, the you know if you can get on YouTube videos to to send in to to Coach Bauer and Coach Tucker and and we can evaluate them on on that because with the with the Division One right now in the, in the dead period we're not allowed out there uh, until January so it's a tough time for any high school senior but I'd say if you are playing it's video I'd say keep your grades up as best you can to give yourself every opportunity for any school but the video is the, really is the only way and Zoom is the only way that we can see people, talk to people, uh, or really get to, to recruit right now. Next question, Doug, it, it starts off by remarking about the dynamic of, of uh, domestic and international players that you have in your program. And, and they want to know what's the process like for recruiting the, those uh, international student athletes. Um, early. Recruiting them early um, and seeing them for a couple of years is the same as uh, the American athlete as well. But I like having the mix of um, the foreign players as well. Uh, we don't get too many, uh, but we, we like the mix of the Icelandic kids, the American kids, the English kids, the Welsh kids, Scottish kids that we've had, um, German kids that we've had as well. I, like, I think it adds to the locker room, but I also think it really adds to the, the campus on, as a whole. The diversity on campus, I think... Um, Every student we've had here, for a foreign kid, uh, particularly in the last 10, 15 years, have graduated with honors. Uh, Lawrence White was an academic All-American, uh, and he also went on to play pro, uh, who we got from England. And the, the ISPA boys, which is the, the, um, the schools that we get them from, the, the private schools, the independent schools in England, are very, very tough academically now. And these kids come in very, very well equipped to, to be able to uh, come into Furman and they're very well educated. A lot of the kids are coming in with already getting um, grades and already getting uh, classes exempt because of the, they've done so well in their A-levels. But I like the banter that goes on. I like the fact that, you know, uh, we had uh, a Lewis uh, here who was uh, from Scotland and, uh, you know, we had guys that were like Welford Moore who's from Alabama would take them home and then yeah, they vice versa. They were uh, they were over there in the, in Scotland together. I, I like the fact we had Australian guys uh, like Dave Prentice comes here and Graham Seagraves helped him as an alumni find a job in New York, and then uh, Graham's now and Dave and uh, Dave's wedding over in Australia. So they've become very very good friends and good relationships worldwide. It's it's a great it's a great thing. Next question is how do you get to the top tier in the NCAA where you're ranked in the top 10 consistently and always have a chance to compete for a national championship? Well, as my, my buddy TJ always said, he goes, if you want to have a good team, get good players. But if you want to have a great team, get great players. And we've always had great players. Uh, I mean, when I first came in here, um, you know, we had we had good players then, uh, and I, I obviously mentioned a few of them, like, like the Higgies and guys like that who would score goals. And people who can score goals can score goals anywhere, and can score goals all the time. And, and we've always talked about that. But we've been very fortunate to be able to recruit really good players, like the Scotty Blunts, who was just a fantastic goalkeeper here. I think Neil Cronin is another one. I mean, different guys that that uh, I always remember recruiting or were already here. We're just very, very good players. John Bradford was another one who was just a, a national team kid who, you know, Matt Goldsmith, those two were buddies. And you recruit that level of kid. Stephen Rodriguez started that uh, with me. Um, and so those players want to play with good players. Those players want to have a good chance of, of playing. And, um, you know, recently we've had some very, very good players, top level players. Obviously, we've had some good guys go into the pros like, like Clint Dempsey and, and Walker Zimmerman recently and Ricardo Clark, all those guys. Shea Salinas is still playing and doing really, really well in San Jose. Johnny Leathers, Alec Kahn, um, the whole list of players that are out there. Um, um, Kyle McLagan's over playing in Iceland right now. So we've, we've got a lot of different players who have graduated from here and are playing pro, but also a lot of guys who aren't playing pro and doing great things in their communities too. So. I think the mix is good. I think uh, recruiting those players is very, very important. Um, but the level, you've got to have good players. Um, but more more now, um, as my program's developed, and we've started to really, really focus on getting really good kids. 
And as all the coaches on here can tell you, you want to be around good kids every day. And um, I ended up a lot of times spending 90% of my time with 10% of my kids. And it was the wrong 10% a lot of time, Dan. And so I made a yeah. conscious effort to say, I want to spend time with the right group of kids, the right kids in my program. And I want to spend time with them uh, because when they graduate, uh, the good kids just do the right thing, register for class, get good grades, uh, you know, do their internships, pass on, they graduate. I'm like, I never spoke to them. I was, spoken, I was speaking to the other guys about missing class or doing the wrong things, that kind of thing. And I'm like, I want to spend 90% of my time with the right, the right kids. And I made that conscious decision. And now uh, you, you end up talking to your kids a lot more about their families, their lives, what they want to do. And, and I tell you what, the alumni have taught me a lot about that. Uh, and we've got such a great group of alumni here. I'm very, very fortunate to do that. And one thing I did in the summer too, um, I started uh, doing an alumni feature on, the, um, on social media. I'm useless at social media. So thank God Coach Tucker was here and thank God Carly was here to help me get those, uh, those things out. But I feature alumni every week, Dan, and a guy that's kept in touch with the program or still loves the program, whether he's giving back or not, it doesn't matter. The fact that he's in touch and he stays in touch with these kids. Um, Scotty Blunt's just hired Brendan Wagley uh, last week to, to join his firm next year. Uh, different guys look after different guys. And then some Graham Seagraves looking after um, Davey from Australia. I mean, so I've done a feature every week on a different alumni. And it allows me to talk to an alumni each week, whether I coach them or before that, like a David May or a Jan Redrup that, that they're, uh, were good alumni here and have kept in touch. Ed Stein, these guys have kept in touch with me, even though I didn't coach them. And I think it's very important that you take care of your alumni because this is their place that they played in. And this is where they can bring their families and their kids and their wives to show them where they played. And I think it's such an important thing to keep in touch with your alumni. I don't think there's any question about it. It all goes into the, 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 the buzzword in college athletics today inside programs, I think is culture and, and building the right kind of culture. And it's obvious that, that you've been able to do that with, with that type of, uh, that, that type of, uh, F, of uh, effort. Um, let, let's do one more question. And then I know you want to, to spend a, a good deal of time with McNeil and, and talking about uh, uh, Down syndrome awareness, but uh, Don, wants to know that uh, after COVID is finally gone and we get back to some semblance of normal, she wants to know if uh, there could be another um, soccer marathon game with the faculty and staff like they did several years back. She said it was a lot of fun getting together and the quotes, try to play soccer. Yeah, it was a, yeah, a lot of bad soccer for a good cause, I called it that. It was uh, <laughs> We raised a lot of money for, uh, for Haiti when they had the earthquake in Japan. Um, with the tsunami and we let, raised a lot of money for um for different things that we did where we had like a 10 to 12 hour game and everyone on campus joined in and actually we were going to try and do it this last year that the den were going to be part of that uh, and actually i was thinking about doing it this year but you're just not allowed to with the safety concerns but that's in the plans the the framework is already there i know ty wants to come on and score a goal and i know Rob Carson is always there trying to take penalty kicks. He's been training in his, his nice tie and his suit. But, the, the, you know, we want Jason Donnelly out there. We want different people out there that, there's, again, a lot of bad soccer with those guys on there, but for a really good cause. We, we're, I definitely want to do that again, Don, um, because it was such an important thing to raise money. And the, the students really rallied around that too, Dan, when we did it. We did a, like an eight-hour game and different people would come to, to play. We keep a running score. Uh, our players would join in uh, every 30 minutes, uh, a different group, like the volleyball team would play the golf team or the tennis team, the football team, the basketball team, everyone joined in. And then you play the faculty, you'd have like FCA, you'd have all different different groups that come from campus to, to play. The, and, and they loved it. Everyone wants to play in the stadium. Everyone wants to play in the Seagraves field. And it's a really cool thing to do. But all of a sudden with Haiti, we started having this uh, rally. Uh, one of the students at the time said that, that people need t-shirts as well. So we said, who, who has extra t-shirts? Everyone. So everyone started bringing t-shirts and we sent them over to Haiti as well for, for the orphans and for, for the, the people over there. And it was great. And 
you know, it was such an important thing that we, we've started doing a lot of different things in the program, Dan, and it's, it's not just the Quinn game. Uh, there's a lot of things go into it. So I, I want, Don, I want to have that game again. Outstanding. Outstanding. Looking forward to to getting to that normal again so we can start doing more stuff like that uh, on this campus and beyond. All right, before we bring McNeil on, we, we did uh, mention the trivia question. I want to give uh, you folks a chance to take a look at this. Um, uh, who invented the catcher's mitt sponsored by Christopher Trucks? Doug Allison, Abner Doubleday, the Rawlings Company, or the Spalding Company? And there's a method to our madness on this question. We'll revisit that and offer up an explanation a little later. Right now, though, we want to welcome in McNeil Cronin, uh, who I've gotten to know over the last three or four years uh, through my association with, with Doug and, and uh, the little, uh, little video show that we've been doing on campus when we had some things to do uh, and, and uh, gotten a chance to, to kind of get immersed in, into the Quinn game and everything that goes along with that. McNeil, welcome, buddy. How are you? I'm good, Dan. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for, uh, thank you for joining us. Where, where's the star of the show right now? So I, I heard you mention her at the top. She's in school. It was the school day. And so she, she's, she's out learning. She's in her private school. And I'm going to talk a lot about school and education for Quinn today, but she's where she should be. She's, she's learning her ABCs and learning to count and who knows what else they're doing there. Uh, that, that is phenomenal. There's a look at that picture uh, again uh, of that, uh, that, that wonderful little girl. And, and look at the smile, look at the smile on dad's <laughs> face. Look at the smile on Doug's face. She's awesome. Uh, and, She's such a great little princess, you know? Yeah. I remember what was it, Doug, uh, two years ago, maybe three years ago when McNeil and his wife and Quinn all came to the, uh, to the radio the booth. booth where, where yeah. I do my, my little show. And it's, the intention was that you and McNeil were going to be on and, and she and mom were going to kind of hang out in the periphery of the thing. And next thing you know, Quinn just kind of took over. She took over. She deserved it. <laughs> yeah. And, and naturally we let her yeah. because it was all about her anyway. Yeah. Um, McNeil, just kind of take us through the, 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 the genesis of, of how this game came about, obviously. And, 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 uh, it goes without saying that Down syndrome awareness is is very much a part of your everyday life now. So just kind of give us the Cliff Notes version of everything. Yeah, thanks for having me on. And it's awesome to see, you know, you got over a, 140 people on here and I've been scrolling through all, all sorts of faces and names from the past. And some of my today still best friends in the world are on this call today. And so thanks for everybody to coming on and, and taking the time to, to come to this lunch and learn, you know, the Quinn game really, it started, you know, like, like a lot of things in our lives start with, with me being part of the Furman soccer family. And I got some pictures and some things that I sent to Ty. So Ty, if you want to just sort of scroll through some of that stuff that you talked about the culture at Furman and, and that's really its most powerful thing. I mean, D Doug has done an amazing job of creating a family. And this is a picture of, you know, one of my teams, I think probably 2002, um, creating a family atmosphere. And the, the biggest things that I take from my time at Furman Soccer, and a lot of this is from Coach Allison, are things that can be applied to, you know, anyone's life, no matter what adversity, no matter what mundane sort of day-to-day -day things you're dealing with. And they're simple things. They're, they're togetherness mm -hmm. and a brotherhood. Um, the idea that when you give yourself to others, you get your best self back. Um, and I, that's a power, those are powerful lessons. Um, and they were, they were learned amongst those 20 guys that I'm in this picture with. And you got amazing players there. Clint Dempsey, Greg Griffin, Shafiq Simo. Um, you, still get, Sorry, he's still those guys. you still got, you got Ricardo Clark right yeah. underneath touchdown. Jesus, this picture was taken in Notre Dame. Uh, Drew Matt Moore, Foxall, Andy, Andy Kidd, look at those guys. Yeah, about, about half this team went on to play professional soccer, and you got a much younger Doug Allison and Charlie Arndt there on the left. Um, <laughs> but the things that the things that we learned as as these young men together were, were those things that you're stronger when you're united, you're stronger when you play for others, and I think in life you're stronger when you live your life for others. And that the more that we did that, 
the better team we were, the stronger group we were. And this particular team, I think, did it stronger than anybody that I've ever been a part of, any team I've ever been a part of. A, a couple of weeks after this picture was taken, this team suffered a horrific car accident. Some of the people pictured in this picture didn't play for our team anymore. Um, and that's a, that's a powerfully emotional thing to go through as young men. And this team played for each other and played for those that couldn't play anymore, more so than any group of people that I've ever been attached with or connected with. And, and in some ways, I, I think that this group became a more cohesive unit than any team I'd ever played on. And so when I, when I became older and an alumni and it was time for me to start my own family, those are the principles that I took to my family were you know, I'm better when I give myself to others. I get my best self back. When I, when I live selflessly, when I live in accepting and inclusive way, when I don't judge people by their cover on their book, I get to know them. I see their potential. That's those lessons. What, what make the best sports team. And I think those lessons are what make the best people in the world. And so here we got a picture of the, the, the very first moments of of my family, my wife here, Kelly, in the in the foreground, and my oldest daughter is Quinn. We have three now, uh, Quinn, Janie, and Case. But this picture was taken probably a minute or two after Quinn was born, and this picture was taken about thirty seconds after we had just been told that she had Down syndrome, and we didn't know Kelly had a normal pregnancy. I mean, it was the last thing in the world that we were thinking about, and so there's smiles on both of our faces. But I can assure you that there's, it's a, it's a, and I know that Susan May and David May, Emery's parents are on this call as well. Some other parents of kids with Down syndrome. That is a sledgehammer to the chest moment where you're, the wind gets knocked out of your lungs. The future seems uncertain. And you are literally mourning the loss of this child that you had dreamt of for at least the last nine months, if not longer. That child is gone and, and something different is in your life. And it takes a moment to get your balance back and get your bearings. And my wife and I both went through that. Every parent of a child with Down syndrome that I've ever met has gone through that. And so a day or two of, of catching ourselves, and it didn't take long before we realized that we were going to just love this child. And it's amazing how much we loved her, how quickly. And you get through that morning. And you start to live your life as a parent with this new child in a very similar way to when you have a typical child. You, you start to bring them to the things that you're interested in. This is a picture of Quinn, six months old, outside of uh, Seagraves Field. Um, and you bring them in and you, my wife and I resolved to a couple key things of how we were going to raise Quinn. We were going to raise her the same way that we'd raise a typical child. We wanted her to reach her fullest potential, whatever that would be. Whatever her ceiling was, we wanted her to reach it. Same as my other two children. We wanted to fight if needed for her to be accepted and to be included. What we saw in Quinn and, and what I see in every picture you'll see today is someone that is more alike than different. Someone that has the same hopes and same dreams and same interests as typical children do and typical people. Um, they wanna be included. They wanna have friendships. They wanna learn. They wanna have fun. And they want to be loved. They don't want, and this, this is where we get into a later part of the story, they don't want to be viewed as different. They don't want to be viewed as other. They certainly don't want to be viewed as less than or inferior in some way. Um, and that's them. They don't want that. Um, and, and who can blame them? No, nobody wants to feel those things. And so we resolved to raise Quinn in an environment and in a culture, in a, in, a, in a broader family with the Furman soccer family being a part of that in a way that was accepting and inclusive and kind um, that would see her for the full, beautiful, loving, kind girl that she was. Um, and so Furman soccer was a big part of that community that she began to grow up in. Um, Doug called me within the first year of her life and wanted to put on some event for her, some annual thing. And, and that's where we decided to come up with the Quinn game for Down syndrome awareness. And there's a great picture of one of the Quinn games here, our families in the front and then the multiple teams, whoever the opponent was that year, combining for a picture. And we were able to partner with the Down syndrome association of the upstate in Greenville 
which is a huge local Down syndrome community, and bring those children out to Seagraves Field. And they walk out with the starting lineup. They hold their hand. Quinn kicks off a little ceremonial first kick. But it, 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 the game is really meant to say the same things that I've said here today, that these individuals in our world, Down syndrome is the most common chromosomal abnormality in the world more common than anything else as far as intellectual disabilities or chromosomal abnormalities. So these, these people are in our world. They're in our neighborhoods. They're in our schools. They're in our communities. They deserve our respect. We are better people for giving them that respect. And we are better people for seeing them for the high potential and the, and the value that they bring to our worlds. Um, and that's what the Quinn game was meant to say. It was meant to be a, a visual, fun, annual celebration of the amazing people in our community with Down syndrome and all that they can bring to our lives. And so you, you, you got five or six years of Quinn's life here. There's another picture from, picture from the Quinn game where Quinn's life was tracking the way that my wife and I wanted it to. She had experienced no uh, people looking at her like less than or other or different as far as I know, she had experienced no discrimination. She, she knew kindness, she knew love, she knew acceptance. And, and that, was, that was what we wanted for her. Our family wanted her to, to grow up that way. Um, another great picture of Coach Allison and I here with, with Quinn. And th the other thing that Doug always says is he wants Quinn to feel like a princess at this game. Yeah. And she most certainly does. And <laughs> sometimes it takes a couple days after the game for us to remind her that you're no longer a princess. You need to follow the rules. You need to... <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey uh, b being a, a grandfather now for a few years, I can understand that. Yeah. I can understand it. Kind of the same thing, isn't it, Doug? Unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And uh, it's just, and, and a little footnote, real quick, McNeil, if I may, is of course, I didn't know about this, anything to do with this until uh, Matt Foxall and, and Andy Kidd, in particular, uh, two of our alumni. Andy called me uh, with Matt and, and said, "Have you seen the 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 what's going on in in North Carolina with with McNeil and the and on TV?" And I'm like, "No." So they sent me a little a clip of McNeil talking uh, on the news about Down syndrome and about Quinn and about standing up for this. And uh, and I'm like, "Oh my God!" You know, it was that moment, Dan, that things changed for me for this program. I mean, it wasn't just all about kind of winning and championship. It, it was I started seeing these guys as not just my players at that age when they leave or they're here. Here's a father doing the right thing for his kid. It wasn't my player anymore. It, he's an old player who is now a father who is doing the right thing for his kid. And, and look at her, you know? So if Andy Kidd and, and Matt hadn't have told me and Fox hadn't have told me, uh, I would never have known. I mean, it could have just been another film that just went on, but seeing that I'm like, I got to do something here. This, this has changed me completely. And, and so, you know, Andy and, and Matt said, let's, let's call McNeil. So, so I did. Well, and I, and Doug, I, I can't thank you enough for the, for the Quinn game. It's, it, it's an annual, one of our best days of the year. And once this, once this COVID stuff sort of clears out, we can get back to playing in-person games. We'll pick that thing right back up again. And this is a picture of Quinn, and this is where we start to come into some adversity that I know the Mays know about. I don't know of a single family with a child with Down syndrome that hasn't experienced some degree of this adversity that I'm going to talk about. And this is a, a, a six-year-old, and just go back one slide there, Ty. Um, a six-year-old that is excited to go to school. We had enrolled her in our local neighborhood public school. By all accounts, a, a great, well-respected school. Um, and Again, what I see here is a girl that's excited to go to school with her friends. She had developed friendships with our neighbors. Everyone's going to the same school right down the street from where we live. Um, it's a girl filled with optimism and excitement of, of a really exciting day. Your first day of kindergarten is the start of your public education and you know the sky is the limit. My wife and I were both very excited and very quickly on this day, we realized that what we saw in this picture someone that's more alike than different, someone with real potential, someone that's smart, that's engaged, that's interested, that wants to please and wants to do well. We, we very quickly found out that organizationally, systemically, our school district, the Winston-Salem Forsyth County School District, 
saw something different, something that should be separated, something potentially less than, something other. And so we, we as our parents, and we realized that the school district saw different things when they looked at our daughter. That they did not know until this day that Quinn had Down syndrome. And so kind of a long story short, the way that things had happened in our school district for decades was that children like Quinn would be identified quickly and early, and then they would be separated and segregated to different schools. They'd be bused to those schools. And in Quinn's case, it was a school about 20 minutes away that had a trailer, one trailer in the very back of the school property where they pulled together all the children in the county in, this, in the age group roughly of Quinn's so that they could all be kind of in one little spot, one trailer. So the plan for Quinn, we found out this first week was that she'd no longer go to her neighborhood school. She would no longer be in a regular mainstream education class with non-disabled children. She would be pulled together. And, and at this point, this is the first day of school. They didn't know Quinn. They, they didn't know her strengths, her weaknesses, what made her tick. They knew that she had Down syndrome. And that was enough in our county. And I, I hate to say it, but I'm certain that that is enough in many counties across the country to identify and segregate that child to a different school, to a different learning environment where they'll be pooled together with only children with other disabilities, autism, Down syndrome, disorders like that. And this isn't just a separate trailer. We learned subsequently that the plan was a separate classroom, separate lunch table in the cafeteria. They even had at Quinn School that she was meant to go to a separate playground. It was tightly fenced in, virtually no access to her non-disabled peers. And for Kelly and I, this was just the antithesis of what we wanted our daughter's education experience to be like. It was the antithesis of what we wanted her life to be like. And so we were naive, neither of us are lawyers, what we knew is that this felt wrong. In our guts, it felt wrong. And so we did a little bit of research and became familiar with laws like the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's a federal civil rights law that was passed in 1990. And it essentially states that every child, especially children with a disability, are to be educated to the greatest extent possible in their mainstream classes, in their neighborhood schools, alongside their non-disabled peers, and if they need support, and if they need a little extra resources, then they're entitled to those. Again, within that same neighborhood school, within that same mainstream classroom. And this was a federal law that was designated as a federal civil rights law. It is American civil right to have an appropriate public education in their least restrictive environment, meaning their neighborhood school. And you know, I was not aware before this that there's a long history of that not happening. And this is going back into the 40s and 50s when children like Quinn were institutionalized. They didn't live in their homes. They were sent to special places where they lived their lives totally separate and segregated from the rest of the communities. And so at this point, we realized that this felt wrong to us. This wasn't what we wanted for our daughter. And we learned that we had the law on our side, that the, what, what our school district was doing was in our minds was not consistent with, with federal civil rights law. We further did more research and realized that a lot of science and literature research has been done on this topic of inclusive education. And every single study, study after study after study said that children with disabilities do far, far better when they're included in their mainstream class and learn alongside their non-disabled peers they're more content, they're happier, they're more confident, their math and science scores are higher, they graduate from high school at higher rates. That all made sense to us. That, that was consistent with what we wanted. What we didn't expect is that all these same studies showed that the non-disabled peers, the typical children, did better in every single one of those categories when they had a child with a disability in their classrooms, learning alongside them. They were happier, they were more content, and somehow, their math and science scores, their graduation rates were higher when they had a child with Down syndrome or a child with autism learning alongside them. And my only explanation for that is that something special happens when you 
it goes back to my original quote, when you give yourself completely to others, you get your best self back. And, and so that's the only explanation for why a child, a, a typical child will, will have a higher math score because they're learning alongside Quinn. It, it's just that something, something magical, something special happens there. And so going to the next slide here, um, one of my favorite quotes from Martin Luther King, it, it, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. And my wife and I had a choice to make. At this point, we had gone back and forth several rounds with the public school district. There's a picture off to the right of, of myself pleading with the Winston-Salem Forsyth County School Board to follow the science, follow the research and the literature, and most importantly, follow the law, a federal civil rights law, and don't in the first week of kindergarten kick my daughter out of her neighborhood school and, and send her to some trailer 20 minutes away where she'd be bused to. And all those pleading, all those attempts were totally unsuccessful. Um, we didn't get anywhere. And so we were left with the choice of whether or not we wanted to become silent on this. And at this point we had enrolled Quinn in a phenomenal private school. Quinn was doing well. Now we're a couple months into the kindergarten school year. The public school district was not backing down at all. Quinn's only option in Winston-Salem for Scythe County Schools was the trailer behind the school 20 minutes away. So we had enrolled Quinn in this private school. She was thriving, she was happy, she was doing well. Um, and we had to make a choice of whether or not we, we wanted to go about our business and just take care of Quinn and, and who was in a good spot at this point or whether or not we wanted to speak up. And the more families in our area we talked to, the more we heard that this story of ours had happened time and time and time again to countless other families. And so we made the choice that we were gonna file a federal civil rights lawsuit against our public school district for violating Quinn's civil right to her least restrictive environment, her neighborhood school to be educated alongside her non-disabled peers. And the wheels of justice move shockingly slow. So the next year and a half was spent with you know, settlement offers and mediation conferences and motion for summary judgment. I, I got a little bit of a, a, a master's degree in this type of litigation, but my wife and I were not willing to settle and we weren't willing to sign any non-disclosure agreements or confidentiality agreements. And so it ended up in, the, in a Raleigh state courthouse about 18 months after Quinn's first day of kindergarten, where we sat before a judge in a, in a Raleigh State Capitol Courthouse. The trial lasted 10 days. Um, and essentially we were saying what had happened to Quinn was discrimination and it was segregation and it violated her civil rights. And the school district was saying, this is the way we've done it for years. And we don't have the resources or the time nor the inclination to educate children like Quinn in a mainstream public school system. This is the only way that our district has ever done it. And it's the way that we're gonna to continue to do it. And after 10 days of testimony and cross-examination um, and driving out to Raleigh e each day, it's about two hours from our home, um, the trial ended and the judge uh, sided with us, my wife and I, on every issue that we brought before the court. We were the prevailing party that this was in fact against the law um, it was in fact supported by no science or no literature or no research. Um, and so that was a huge, a huge local thing, uh, in our community that it, it broke a mold of our public school district segregating out children like Quinn that I think had been going back five, six decades. Um, and now in our state, because of this verdict, because of these judges orders, our state is now held to the standards that they should be held to the federal the federal laws of the Americans with Disabilities Act that children with disabilities have to be educated in their least restrictive environment in other words in their regular classroom so children across this state are now being brought back in from these exceptional children programs or these special education programs and they're bringing being brought back into their classroom to learn alongside their non-disabled peers in many counties across the state, those exceptional children programs, those trailers that are positioned in one school in the county are being eliminated. And those children are being brought back in where the science says they do the best um, and where the science says that their non-disabled peers also do the best by 
having the chance to learn alongside them. Um, and so, you know, to bring it full circle with Furman Soccer, and I know we're coming up on the end of our hour here, you know, the, the lessons of fighting for your family members, fighting for your brothers when needed, um, the lessons of, of the belief that you get your best self back in return when you completely give yourself to something else or to another cause. Those are all lessons that I learned from Coach Allison um, and that I learned from Furman Soccer. I learned from the teammates that I had, that many of whom are on this call today. And I received a note a month or so ago from one of the current Furman Soccer players, Cole McClagan. And it's pictured here and a sketch that his girlfriend had drawn of a photograph taken at one of the Quinn games. Cole in the sketch is holding Quinn's hand. And this note in the foreground here is a note from my, to my wife and I from Cole, just explaining how much the Furman Soccer family means to him, how much the Quinn game means to him, that it's one of his favorite memories throughout the year and that he can't wait to see Quinn smile again the next time we can all get together and celebrate the Quinn game. And it's notes like that and, and the impact that, that this game has had on Cole, it circles back to the reasons that the typical children and non-disabled children do better when they're around people like Quinn. Um, because something magical happens there. When you, when you give yourself to something greater than yourself, you give yourself to something other than you. Um, there's magic in that, I believe. Uh, and these, these ideals of acceptance and inclusion and being kind to people, they are, they are the ideals of my life. And I, I'm biased, Quinn's my daughter. These are things that have been solidified in me since, since Quinn became a part of my family. But these issues are the most important thing to me in my entire life. Um, and I'm convinced that in our world today, we could use a lot more of that. The, 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 the conflict and the adversity and the, the culture of our, of our communities, a lot of times is hostile. And I think if, if we spend more time and slow down and be accepting and inclusive of people with differences, I, I think that the world is a better place for that. Um, and so the last little video here, it's, it's a 40 second video, is a, a little highlight video that was put together by the, the Furman soccer crew after one of the Quinn games. And, Ty, if we can play this, this is this is kind of, this kind of sums up the Quinn game. Sorry, right, I think we're having a little technical difficulty on the uh, video, but I do have a, another video, McNeil, that I can share since this one's not working. Hold on a sec. Yeah, that's great. And folks, we may go five minutes over uh, or so in, in this particular lunch and learn, but that's fine. That, that was one of Neil's best assists ever. <laughs> that doesn't speak much for your defensive coaching, though, Doug. That's all right. I don't mind. That was the best goal. Look <laughs> at our guys. Look at the smile. The smiles. Is there, Ty, is there a way to bring Susan May in to say because the work she does with Dan Syndrome in, in Kansas, too? Susan, are you there? Oh. I think we got the other video first. Oh, Let's nice. This. There's no question. She knows she's the star of the show. <laughs> Look at that smile. Yeah, McNeil, uh, Doug referenced that you've got Susan with you, maybe a couple of other folks. If we could give them just a minute or so maybe to, to kind of uh, join in here and if, if you want to introduce them. Susan uh, is a mom of Emery May, who's one of our former players. I think is hopefully on today. And David May is uh, – her husband who played here. I played against him in the old black and white days. But Susan uh, um, is definitely very, very involved in the Down syndrome awareness in, in Kansas. Uh, Susan, are you there? I am. Thank we you for including me. Yeah, thank you for including me. 
you know, I just serve on uh, some program boards now with the Down Syndrome Society of Wichita. I used to run the um, society for about nine years when Wyatt was younger. Um, our son with Down Syndrome, Emery's little brother, is 17. He's a junior in high school. And um, I just appreciate so much, just like McNeil said, you helping us to raise awareness about Down syndrome, to raise awareness about the amazing value that people with Down syndrome have in our lives and in our communities. And um, I would encourage um, everybody who's um, watching and listening to um, continue to just look around you at your workplace, at your church, in your neighborhood, and strive to continue to include people with Down syndrome and other special needs. Um, you know, once a, a kid's in school, they um, have a lot of supports and services as we're at the stage with Wyatt where he's going to graduate in the next couple of years, and it's a whole new world but he still has a lot of skills and interest and value that he can offer in a workplace um, and by volunteering. And I just would encourage all of you to um, consider ways that you can include people with Down syndrome in your lives, in your workplaces, um, because they do have a lot of value that they can offer. Yeah, thank you, Susan. I love it when uh, when these guys come together and you guys talk about this. And it's such an important cause in our program. So thank you for all you do as well. You're welcome. Yeah, I know we're running on the clock here, but there's one question specifically for McNeil I want to get answered. And then we need to quickly put up the poll and the trivia question results before we give Doug a final word. But McNeil, this question came in during your presentation. Um, so if you can answer it quickly, it says, my son has autism and is educationally low functioning. We have high expectations for him as well, but he is separated into a special ed class. He's integrated into a typical classroom. What advice would you give as we continue to advocate for him and his future? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and you know, it, a lot of counties will have a, a full spectrum of services and the, the least restrictive environment is, is to the greatest extent possible. So the the caveat to that is if, if the disability prevents your child's development and learning and education from taking place in a mainstream classroom, it, so the, the levels are, you know, you're, you're in a mainstream classroom totally unsupported. If you struggle there or are not able to learn in that environment, then there needs to be a, an escalation of services all the way up to a shadow or a one-on-one -on -one aid. A one-on-one -on -one aid is something that's entitled to you in, in federal law if you need it. And so once all of those services and supports have been exhausted and provided to you, if, if then the child is still struggling in that environment, then I think it's appropriate to, to maybe go into a separate environment or self-contained classroom um, because learning and, and the ability to be educated is the most important thing. But under the law, that's the, the sort of stepwise way that it should go. Additional supports and services all the way up to a one-on-one -on -one aid devoted only to your child. And then and only then, if the child is still struggling, should they be totally removed from that, that mainstream classroom. McNeil, thank you so much for uh, sharing uh, the, the story and the, uh, the fight that, that you and your family have been through. I can't wait until the spring and Hopefully this thing is going to be in our rear view mirror. And, and, and hey, we look at it from the standpoint in 2021, we can get two Quinn games, one in the spring and, and one in the fall. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, that, that would be great. And thank you to you, Dan. Thank you to Ty. And thank you, most importantly, to Coach Allison. Uh, it, it means so much to us that you guys give us this opportunity to speak and about something we care so much about. And um, I'll echo Susan's comments that, you know, for all of you on the call, 140 of you or so, go out and, and live an accepting and inclusive life. Give people the benefit of the doubt. See the potential in them. And I promise you, you'll, you'll be better for it as well. All right, McNeil, thank you. Before we give Doug the final word, let's quickly put the poll up for the, re, for the results and then the trivia question. The poll, uh, they, they're not buying the total transition, Doug. Uh, Chris Buy me. Doug's poll. 
still an English accent with a hint of Southern to it. So it haven't quite completed the transition yet. Crikey, I can see that. Little, little Aussie accent thrown in there as well, yeah. terminology. And then the trivia question, Said there was a method to our madness. This is the only baseball question. You know, he gives me a hard time about soccer. This is the only baseball question he knows. And, and I took a little bit of, uh, of uh, liberty with it and, and saying who invented the catcher's mitt so I could throw those companies in there. But actually, it, it's, it's on record as the first professional baseball player to wear a baseball glove was Doug Allison. Was That's the right. Eight, the 1870... Red stockings. I think uh, our Doug Allison was a freshman at South Carolina that year. Yeah, look at my hair in those days, Dan. Not yeah, so look bad. at that. <laughs> uh, there, there is kind of a resemblance there in that picture. But uh, the 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 story is that he was the catcher in the barehanded days, and he had an injured hand, and he actually fashioned a a buckskin glove to wear on his left hand, and thus was born the baseball glove. And hmm as I name my radio show after myself, so I don't forget the name, it's kind of the same thing. That's the only baseball question, you know, that's it. That's all I know about baseball. Then that's all. <laughs> but, uh... um, I'll just give you a chance to, to kind of wrap things up here for us. Uh, you sacrifice most of your time for the greater cause with McNeil, uh, which is not surprising to those of us who know both of you, but uh, whether it's about your soccer program or about Quinn, whatever, we'll give you the final word. Yeah, and then how about McNeil? What, what, that's the kind of alumni that we love having. And I know there's a lot on, but he epitomizes our guys and, and their leaders in communities where they go. And McNeil, we love you and wish you the best and all that. And we'll, we'll be doing Quinn games. As long as I'm here, we're doing them. Don't, don't worry. But I also want to thank guys like Matt Thomas and Andre Bernardi in the weight room. I think every head coach and coach on this call will want to thank them as well. They're incredible people that we're around right now. And they push our players uh, every day, not just uh, physically, but but mentally as well. And I think the incredible job that they're doing. And one other thing I'd be remiss to, there's a guy named um, Jeff Coppins on this who runs back-to-back -back ministries. And one of the things I want in my program before kids graduate, and I, it's important that they graduate, Dan, is that they've had a chance of a foreign tour and they have a chance to do a mission trip. And all of our kids, unfortunately, this spring was supposed to be the mission trip time, but Jeff Coppins runs back-to-back -back ministries. And every four years, our kids are going to Haiti or Mexico through him. And every other four years in between, the years in between, we take foreign trips with our kids. So the Furman Advantage is such an important thing. I appreciate guys like that in our community, like the Spinxes and the Slagles and and those guys. And, and you know, I, I love doing what I'm doing here. And, and you know, our guys are becoming great leaders as so many of these student athletes are at Furman. So the, the head coaches they have are, are brilliant. I'll say this as we wrap up. We all enjoy, I think, watching uh, what we consider to be big-time college athletics, but we also know what that has become over the years. Folks here on this Zoom call today and, and on practically every Lunch and Learn we do, you have seen an example of what college athletics is supposed to be. Yes, it's about competition. Yes, it's about becoming the best you can be as, as a player uh, and, and all of that. But what's it supposed to prepare you for? It's supposed to prepare you for doing something bigger and better beyond the world of athletics when you graduate. And I, I think we have seen a great, great example of what at its, at its core what the college athletic experience is supposed to be about when you have a former athlete like McNeil Cronin doing what he's doing, staying in touch and the connection between the coach and the player all these years later doesn't get any better than that. Thank you for joining us for today's Lunch and Learn presented by Sharon View Federal Credit Union. Uh, we will be back tomorrow with the webinar celebrating the 88 National Championship team. You have to register for that. Ty actually put the link for that in the chat function. If you missed it, you can go to the firm and social media. And then again, no lunch and learn next week. It's election day. Go vote. And, and regardless of what side of the political spectrum you're on, be kind to one another. All right. We'll see you in two weeks on the next lunch and learn when we visit with the uh, tennis coaches, JJ Whitlinger and Adam Herendine. For all of us at Furman, I'm Dan Scott saying thanks for joining us. God bless you and so long, everybody.